चैप्टर this uh, course will deal with almost every subside of cancer in our body however we are going to start with head and neck malignancies and today's module which is the first module will deal with oral cavity cancer and paranasal sinus malignancies before getting into the program however i would want to invite professor leeton nahabishas the president of ari west bengal chapter to kindly say a few words thank you pritha and a very very good evening to everybody as the president of the aroi west bengal chapter this is my extreme pleasure to welcome all the participants of this teaching program on contouring and planning we are feeling very happy to see your overwhelming response and our young colleagues who have drafted this program with utmost care and diligence will feel motivated now with such a tremendous support from you in fact the number of registrations have far exceeded our expectations so i would appeal to you to utilize this learning opportunity to the fullest extent when we were students we did not have such opportunities today the technology has made it possible as you will learn from experts not only from different parts of india but also from other part of the globe like usa and other countries so taking this opportunity once again i would further request you to be interactive and please do come forward with your suggestions and critical comments our members are ready to help you if you feel bored sometimes please express it there is always scope for improvement but please maintain your support till the last class is taken and then only this effort will be successful once again a great thanks to all of you long live ry Thank you so much, sir. With those encouraging words, I would now want to move to Dr. Abhishek Basu, who is the secretary of ARI West Bengal chapter, to say us a few words. Good evening. So uh, I would just request if I am granted access to start the video because I think there is some issue regarding this. Just a minute. Can I check? Yes, sir. So, uh. I think there is some issue, Jiba. Could you please uh, just uh, put up the presentation that I have uh, had? Yes. Sure, sure. Just a minute. So, at the outset, I would like to welcome all the participants for this AROI West Bengal chapter course. As our president has already mentioned, it has been an endeavor of the AROI West Bengal chapter to go ahead with uh, such courses, not only in the physical format but also in the virtual format over the last two years when we have been bogged down by the pandemic. and uh, academics did take a back seat to some extent but we did not and we have had a number of courses and this is in fact the fourth such course that we are going to organize on a virtual platform and we are very happy with the responses that we have got uh, from the delegates and participants across india as well as there are a few who are joining us from bangladesh so uh, that is an, a very encouraging sign for all of us and Uh, just to put things in perspective i think this is very important 
that uh, we continue to strive to have this kind of courses in the virtual platform because the, the outreach of that is uh, significantly more. You cannot cater to this many number of people in sitting across the globe, if I may say so, and uh, reaching out to one another in terms of academics. So this is very important. And I would specially like to mention the names of uh, the, the people who have made this course possible. Dr. Kostov Mojumdar, Dr. Onupam Dotto, Dr. Monidipa Mondol, and Dr. Dipanjan Mojumdar. So these are the four people who have been instrumental in putting up this course and uh, giving uh, you the opportunity to learn, uh, as has been mentioned, across various modules that we will have. And uh, I'll just very briefly run through. So can you just make this, uh, can you just, correct. So I hope uh, you can see the screen. So can I go to the next slide? So uh, at the outset, why this course specifically? So we all know that the radiotherapy planning vitals are very, very important, especially for the residents for whom the course is meant. Now, target volumes and OARs concept and delineation is, of course, important, but there are several courses that deal with this. So why is this course special? It is special because we'll not be discussing guidelines only in this course. We'll discuss the practical aspects of uh, the delineation and that would be done as a collaborative effort by the radiologist and the radiation oncologist. Then again, we delve into the planning where we'll go for the radiotherapy technique. Now, this is something which is very, very important um, as, for example, compared to dose prescription, which most of you already know, because most centers are now equipped with modern equipment. We have observed that there is less clarity on conventional planning aspects. So many of you, for example, do not have an access to a telecobalt machine. So you would not know what 2D planning is all about and how radiation has actually evolved over the decades for, to come to the current state. We are now delivering the most conformal uh, and treatment with the high end machines. Uh, can I go to the next slide, please? So what, if, what will be the workflow next? So this is basically the design radiological anatomy conventional 2D planning and conventional 3D, uh, conformal 3D planning. So these are the basic three uh, steps of the course, which will be followed across all the classes. Next. So the radiological anatomy, as we already mentioned, would be dealt with jointly by the radiologist and the radiation oncologist as a live interaction. Next. In conventional planning, we would have the concepts of target in 2D. This is very important because I think, again, most of you do not have this concept at all, that there would be a definite concept of a target even in 2D. And the steps of 2D planning, including the field borders as bony anatomy and skin markings, and of course, the techniques that are involved. Next. And in conformal planning, we would specifically, of course, discuss the targets and OARs and also the workflow of the planning, which would include, for example, immobilization, simulation, how we do it practically. So we would at every step try to be more practical rather than uh, discussing evidence, which you all know is present in textbooks. So this is specifically meant to be something that you can take home and actually implement in your clinic and learn on the go. Uh, next. We would also discuss briefly about the evolution. So how we have moved from 2D to 3D, again, in practical terms for the different subsites that we would be covering. Next. The uh, discussion shall be by modules, as has already been talked. And we would emphasize on the basic concepts. So we would not look at uh, the latest evidence, for example, but we would be stressing on the basics of planning, how you should go about it, and we would have extensive question answer sessions where we would strongly encourage that all of you please interact with the faculty from all uh, across India and as well as international who would be guiding you through. And even if all the questions cannot be accommodated within the stipulated time, you can mail us back and we'll try to get the answers for you. Next slide. And this, is, this shall be my last slide. And we would have post course e certificates distributed, which was already mentioned. Uh, this is the last slide just to show who is attending. So we already know that there are so many who have joined here. This has been overwhelming for us with more than 450 people 
mostly JRs and SRs, but it is uh, interesting and, and humbling for us that many consultants and faculty have also actually registered for this course. So with that, I would again welcome you to the course and not waste any more time and hand it over to Krita to continue uh, with the program. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so before we get into the uh, main program, I would want to uh, make a few housekeeping announcements for all the participants. I would want to say that this is, like sir said, it is a definitely an interactive session. So please feel free to ask any question in the chat box. I will be very uh, honored to ask those questions on your behalf to our faculty members. Please keep it uh, brief and to the point and uh, kindly change your uh, name to your, uh, the participant name uh, in, to your uh, to your actual name and surname so that we can address uh, the person who is actually asking the questions. Uh, you can see that a stipulated amount of time has been kept at the end of every, every talk to answer these questions. However, due to time constraints, if we are unable to answer some of your questions, kindly mail it to the email address I'm going to leave into the chat box right now. A brief instructions is also available in the chat box for anyone who wishes to uh, follow it throughout the talk. So I'll also want to tell you that the recordings of this talk will be available at the official YouTube channel and I request you to subscribe to it and you can obviously refer back to it uh, at any time you want. So now I would want to invite the experts for tonight, Professor Olo Ghoshchidhar, who is the head of the Department of Radiation Oncology at SSKM and IPGMR Hospital, Kolkata, and Professor Shushmita Ghoshal, who is the head of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, to kindly invite their speakers and take the, pro take the program forward. Thank you. Uh, Alok, will you do the honors, please? OK. Good evening and welcome everybody to this webinar. Uh, I would like, uh, uh, like to invite all the speakers uh, who are ready to start the program right now without uh, uh, going through the formal introduction because nobody wants to know uh, uh, who is who. Everybody knows everyone, everyone in the ROI family. So let us start our program today. So may I ask the first speaker to start the 2D versus C uh, speaker. The, uh, who is the first speaker? May I know the name? I do not know how the uh, program is. Uh, Dr. Dr. Shonak Pal. He is a consultant radiologist uh, at uh, Dishan Hospital and the radiation oncologist for this talk would be Dr. Kousa Mojumdar, who is a consultant radiation oncologist at Tichuranda National Cancer Institute. They'd be giving us a presentation on radiological anatomy for radiation oncologists, of course, pertaining to oral cavity and paranasal sinus malignancies. Can, sir, can you please uh, start your presentation? Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Preetha. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam, uh, for the, am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Okay. So uh, before uh, starting, uh, I would uh, thanks uh, ARO is Bengal chapter to giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shonak for starting the, and uh, we have Dr. Shonak Pal, he's a radiologist and Dishan Hospital. And uh, today I am not interacting uh, all the delegates with uh, this anatomy because I am as novice as you guys. So I am just a bridge between the radiologist, experienced radiologist and the delegate and the radiation oncologist or the going to be radiation oncologist. So I would just interact with him so that uh, we can know the radiology properties uh, that will help us in the contouring. Uh, today's topic is the of oral cavity and the paranasal sinus. So uh, not going to any delay for that. Uh, I would start with that uh, for any kind of uh, radiation planning, that is the 3D planning, you have to do a, a planning CT scan. So for the head neck planning CT scan, as you all know, even as a first year of PGT, you know that uh, you have to do a, uh, orf um, I mean, uh, immobilization device, you have to thermoplast immobilization device, you have to made for the immobilization part, and then you have to acquire the CT scan. So in case of the head neck cancer, any kind of, uh, it, is, it is customary to uh, start the planning scan from the, I mean, at the vault and up to the carina, okay? And uh, normally a three millimeter cut should be taken so that uh, the contouring can be done properly. 
Now, uh, for this uh, CT scan, uh, we would we would give some a contrast media. Okay, so contrast we have given either by a uh, injector or where injector is not uh, available. We done by the after uh, after this IV cannulation. We have to by the syringe. You have to done it. So my first question to uh, Dr. Shonak is that uh, after uh, completion of the IV contrast infusion, after how much time? we have to acquire the CT scan of the head neck so that we can uh, see the vessels and the, I mean, contrast can go in the proper places in the head neck region. So what is your take on it? Kosabda, thank you for uh, letting me into this platform. It's very new to me and I am uh, obliged to Dr. Biswas, Dr. Bashu, Dr. Alok and Dr. Preetha for uh, allowing me this session. And uh, uh, coming to your question, Kosabda, the first thing uh, that I would uh, like to say is that I'm using a Radiant software. It's a trial version. I think that uh, that uh, clears our uh, approval issues. And uh, to uh, answer your question, contrast preferably is not given by hand and through a pressure injector. And by pressure injector, it's a device that on which you can fix the amount of dose of contrast that is delivered on a ml per second basis. For head and neck malignancies or head and neck scans, it is usually a divided contrast dose that we give so, so that there is enough contrast bolus coming in as and when we are doing the scan. And we don't have a washout phase and the entire anatomy has adequate amount of enhancement. First, we'll do a plain scan. Then there, there is a school of thought which says that you can just give a bolus dose at 3 ml per second at around 1 ml per kg body weight and then take the scan at the head, head and neck region at around 35 seconds. That usually gives us enough ad, uh, enhancement of the structures in the head and neck region. But uh, on a practical basis, we usually split the bolus at 3 ml per second for part of the dose and then 2 to 2.5 ml per second for the rest of the dose, followed by a saline flush so that the uh, enhancement it does not wash out when we actually get the scan done by around 35 seconds. So if we have a 30, uh, 60 ml contrast and we give over 3 ml per second, it takes 20, 20 seconds for the contrast to get inside the body and 14, 15 seconds for, for the brachial to brain time. I mean, that means when we inject from the brachial vein, it goes up, up to the upper uh, head and neck region in around 14 seconds. So adding that, it comes to 20, 20 plus 14, 35 seconds. So that is the basis of the timing cutoff that we use for head and neck imaging post-contrast in post-contrast CT. Okay, so now, uh, that's a very important information. Thank you. So uh, in uh, normally uh, we have uh, normally in case of the radiologist when done this uh, head neck scan, uh, they are done in the puff cheek technique. So be because the puff cheek technique is important because various uh, structure can be separated between these things. So, um, uh, but in our setting for the uh, for for planning scan for the re re uh, replicate the same position every day in the radiotherapy. Puff cheek techniques is not used. So in that case, a non puff cheek -tick condition or the normal position, we have to take the planning CT scan. So uh, now I'm going to the straight to the uh, leap anatomy. So uh, could you please show Dr. Shona, where is the commissure of the leap is present uh, and the upper leap and lower leap position in this CT scan? Okay, uh, Kosov, uh, Dr. Kosov, I will just dig digress for a second. The are you able to see my shared screen? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this is the image taken in a puff cheek technique and this is the same patient, sorry. This is the same patient in a non puff cheek technique. Okay, so this is what you usually do during your planning scans. And this is what you usually get during your diagnostic scans. Uh, these uh, scans that I will be showing you at this present moment will be a little 
more uh, of little, little more resolution than the normal planning scans that you do because these are resolved at 1.2 millimeter and whether whereas what you do for planning scans is at 3 millimeter so i'll take the anatomy at the level of the um, uh, commissures you can uh, see okay just a minute sir so this is the level of the skin this green marker this is the skin so where the skin fuses on either side and the subcutaneous fat it is not visualized any further this is the location of the modulus what we call as and what uh, you're asking as the commissures we will go to the sagittal images and that will clear out the air a bit so this is the upper lip this is the lower lip i think you can follow the pointers if if any problem please uh, please uh, interrupt no, and let me know absolutely fine okay so when we scroll on either side we can see that the upper lip and the lower lip fuses and there is no much dimpling at at on either sides of this this is the level of the modulus or the commissure on one side and then again when we go to the other side this is the level of the modulus on the other side when we go further laterally this structure this is the buccinator muscle and uh, so here we in the uh, actual actual yes buccinator? yes 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 doctor definitely so this is the buccinator muscle okay and this is this plane here one minute this plane here this is the buccal fat on either side and this is the subcutaneous fat which is separate from the buccal fat and again on this axial image i will uh, reinstate when we have the skin fused with that of the lip with loss of fat of the subcut loss of subcutaneous fat this is the level of your commissures or the modulus okay next question doctor would you like to see it on a non puff chick image am i audible uh yes uh, that would be great if you okay. can show it in the non puff chick yes sir i will try to um, uh, do that see on non puff chick image again we follow the same thing this is the skin and this is the subcutaneous fat here where the skin and the where the subcutaneous fat is no more seen this soft tissue mound is the modulus on either side okay so this will what no, this will what you will be seeing on your planning ct scans i'll bet they will be 3 mm a bit more thick six sections uh, next question dr costa Dr. Kostov, are you online? Okay. Sorry. Uh, so yeah. the, my next uh, will be the oral tongue. So oral tongue is separated from the oropharynx by imaginary line extending from the anterior transverse pillar to the junction of the hard and soft palate to the circumvallate papilla. So mm -hmm. could you please show us the circumvallate papilla and the uh, the transverse pillar which uh, uh, attached to this? Uh, I mean. Uh, the hard and soft pellet uh, and the anterior two third part. Okay, first uh, to answer your first first question, we will go to the circumvallate papilla. So, one moment. Sorry. So we have the dorsum of the tongue, which is projecting superiorly, and when we go to the mid sagittal planes, we can see that this there is a small dimple here. at this level and after that again there is another bulge of the tongue so this dimple is at the level of the circumvallate papilla and we, if we draw in a line from this dimple to the inferior margin of the mandible anything that is antero superior to this is the oral tongue and anything that is posterior inferior to this is the oropharyngeal tongue but this anatomy is only for demonstration purpose and again you will need to know it on your ax axial sections so it is a bit of a challenge to identify this on axial sections but if you can closely check there is a v shaped structure here i mean i'll go one one slice ab above 
and again i'll roll it down so if can you appreciate this v shaped structure here yeah yeah absolutely yeah okay, okay. so this is this is the usual demarcation of the and uh, oral tongue anteriorly mm -hmm. and oropharyngeal tongue posteriorly Okay. 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 And uh, coming to your other question, the anterior tonsillar pillars. Mm -hmm. So when we check from the level of the retromolar trigone, the soft tissue that goes along this is the anterior tonsillar pillar. Okay. So we are going down, down, and this is the level of the anterior tonsillar pillar. Again, here is the V-shaped structure. So this is the part of the oropharyngeal tongue. This is your anterior tonsillar pillar, and uh, that will pretty much differentiate between the oral and the oropharyngeal tongue. I think I had been able to absolutely. delineate the structures for sure, you. Sure, 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 absolutely. Thank you. So uh, the uh, next uh, thing is that I'm not going to the very deep to the muscle of the tongue, but in the whatever, uh, what the muscles, extensing muscle can we see in the CT scan? Can you show us? Yes, doctor. So let me pointer. Okay. This part here. And this one here are the genioglossus muscles. Okay, I uh, please uh, keep a note of the marking. I will uh, scroll up and down. The markings will not be there in all the sections. So here is the genioglossus muscle going down. And this is the genial tubercle. Let me give it a pointer first. Hmm. This is the genial tubercle. And the muscles arise from this genial tube, muscles arising from this genial, genial tubercle are the genioglossus. So when we scroll up, uh, sorry, I'm scrolling down. When we scroll up, the lingual septum is in the midline. I think everybody can appreciate yeah, this yeah. Uh, black thing here. And, and the muscles just on either side of the lingual septum is the genioglossus muscle. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we scroll up further cranially. And there is another muscle which is just at the lateral margin of the oral tongue. Okay, this is the hyoglossus muscle on either side. These are the two extrinsic muscles of the tongue that we are bothered in consideration because in, in infiltration of these structures usually uh, change the T staging and I will again go to the same structures on a coronal plane which will be e easier for the residents to appreciate. Uh, just a small uh, thing I to make and uh, now new ADCC 8 edition, the extensive muscle of the tongue invasion is not changing the T stage. Okay. So thank you have. so much. Okay. Thank you so much. No. I will have to go back on my no records and check it. Thanks, Dr. Costa. Yeah. So this is the lingual septum and these two are the genioglossus muscles. And on coronal, it is a bit difficult to identify the hyoglossus muscles. These are the muscles here but when we have attenuation from the body of the mandible which causes amount of streak artifact in most patients and if there is a, a tooth that has uh, some amount of capping we will not be able to identify this muscle because of extensive uh, streak artifacts from these uh, bones Okay. Next question, please. Thank you, doctor. So, uh, next is when going to the floor of the mouth. Uh, normally, mm -hmm. what happens? Uh, it is very difficult uh, to differentiate between the tongue and the floor of the mouth due to when you are not doing the pop cheek technique. So, could you please tell us the uh, how to uh, identify the floor of the mouth and how to differentiate for the tongue? Uh, yes, doctor. So, for that, we will start from the base of the mandible. So, this two are the muscles that we have already spoken about genioglossus and the fat plane on either side this fat plane here this belongs to the sublingual space or the floor of the mouth so this okay. this one here and uh, this one here on either side is the so the sublingual so this is space over, or the floor this is the overlap thing between the floor of the mouth and tongue yes the okay. the this this area of the fat plane, I would like to take up a puff chick image if, if you permit me. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Sure, yeah. So we are taking this in just a minute. Yep. So now it is much more obvious. This area, one sec. This is the genioglossus and whatever fat we have is in this is the floor of the mouth. 
okay Okay, okay, okay. And the uh, mucosal uh, mucosal epithelium, uh, mucosa uh, overlying the floor of the mouth is there. This entire structure is the floor of the mouth. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. And uh, another thing I would like to add with the uh, tongue or any oral cavity uh, tumor is that any oral cavity lesion which is going to the masticator space or mm -hmm. perigoid plate or carotid artery, it is ultimately to the T4B. And this is important thing that, that uh, uh, maximum in these cases, uh, it is difficult to resect in those cases or this is a borderline resectable or unresectable. So could you show us that masticator space and perigoid plate here? Yes, we'll start with the first thing. So yeah. this is the ramus of the mandible. I yeah. think everybody will uh, accept this without any uh, ado. And uh, the muscle just on the lateral surface of the ramus of the mandible, the big fat muscle here is the... What, what muscle is this? Masseter. Masseter muscle, correct. Very good. So when we go higher up, this is the condylar this is a condylar process here and anteriorly is a coronoid process. The muscle on the medial aspect of the coronoid process is the temporalis muscle. I have marked it out and we will trace it cranially. And you can see this muscle goes into um, uh, along the greater wing of sphenoid and along the squamosa of the temporal bone. So this, if you have any confusion, you start tracing from the squamosa of the temporal bone. The muscle on either side of the squamosa of the temporal bone will be the temporalis. Get down along this and it will end at the coronoid process. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, coronoid process. Yeah, correct. Coronoid process of the mandible. And these two muscles from the major two muscles of the uh, masticator space and the other two muscles are the pterygoid muscles. So the inferior muscle and the medial muscle is the pterygoid, which is marked in this. So this okay. is the medial pterygoid. Medial pterygoid. This is the inferior and the medial muscle. So when we go higher up on a cranial section, we can see it goes into the pterygoid uh, yes. process and between the medial and the lateral pterygoid plates. I, I think you can all, all appreciate there is a re inverted U structure here at this level. So this is the lateral this is the lateral pterygoid plate and this is the medial pterygoid plate. The muscle that goes in between is the medial pterygoid muscle. The muscle that starts on, uh, on the lateral side of the lateral pterygoid plate is the lateral, lateral pterygoid muscle, which is this one. Okay. And okay. let me mark it out. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, another one I want to uh, show here, you have already shown us the mandible division of the mandible that is the uh, ramus condyle and coronoid process could you just show us the uh, angle of the mandible how could i identify that i i think we can try that so this is the old ah. first year anatomy image i think uh, we all of us remember so then coming back to this whatever straight portion of the mandible is there here and here, these are the ramus of the mandible. Yeah. Okay. And then as we go down, we can uh, see that straight plate goes medially. And this is the level of the angle of the mandible. Okay. And uh, as we go further down, this is the level of the body of the mandible. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. So uh, next I move to the heart palate. So heart palate is a seminular space comprising of the inner surface of the superior alveolar bridge and the posterior edge of the uh, maxillary palatine bone. So could you show us the, the superior alveolar bridge and the, I mean the heart palate part? Okay. On axial or on other? Uh, others, uh... You can uh, take your call. Uh, okay, first, I, I, I'll try to do it on the axial, but it will be difficult to explain on axial. Let's give it a shot. So this is the bone window image. I think you can, uh, I think I don't need to elaborate on the bone window and the soft tissue window. So wherever we see these irregularities at the ridge of the maxilla uh, with the roots of the teeth embedded, this is the uh, alveolar ridge and uh, better so appreciated on a sagittal or a coronal image. So 
this area this area is the maxillary ridge and for your next question dr costa i will uh, so probably the heart palate one this I mean, is the, the this is yes the maxillary ma uh, alveolar ridge this is the mandibular alveolar ridge on the um, uh, bottom so as far as the bony erosion is concerned if there is erosion along this um, uh, alveolar process it does not upstage the tumor and uh, give me a moment So this is another patient. I have uh, changed the patient because of the question that you asked me. Okay, in here, can you appreciate this flat bone here? Yeah, yeah. This is the palatine process of the maxillary bone. Okay. 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 And there is some amount of irregularity here at this level. And again, I'll go back to your pri our primary patient that we were dealing. So that irregularity is in this level. And do you want me to mark it out or the pointer is? No, okay? that is fine. Absolutely fine. So okay. whenever we have this uh, fusion of the palatine process of the maxilla and the palatine bone, the fusion is not as smooth. And we have some amount of this irregularities here as, as we can see on either side. So this marks the level of the palatine bone, which is posterior to the palatine process of the maxillary bone. So this entire thing is the palatine bone, which is occasionally not seen properly. However, if you can see these rounded foramina, this is the, this is the greater greater palatine foramen mm -hmm. and this is the lesser palatine foramen. So when we see these two foramina and the bone just adjacent to this is the palatine bone on either sides. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. This is difficult to see on uh, other sections, uh, um, specifically on sagittal, it is difficult to differentiate between the two bones. Uh, so we have to make it some quick because we are running out of time. Yes. So now, yes. now we are moved to the buccal mucosa. So okay. the buccal mucosa uh, is the uh, mucosa included the mucosal surface of the cheeks and lip. So in the inferior part, there is a upper and lower alveolage, what, whatever you have already told us. So could you please just show us the upper GBS and the lower GBS part of it? Okay, doctor. We will again move to another thing. So this is a puff cheek technique. On the right side, you can uh, very well see the tumor. On We will discuss on the left side because it is our comparison normal anatomy. This is the level of the upper gingiva buccal sulcus. This is the level of the lower gingiva buccal sulcus. Okay. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, and another thing is that uh, in the, up, in the uh, upper uh, alveolar ridge, there is a pterygo palatine arch which has been present uh, in the, I mean, in the posterior part. So could you please show us the pterygo palatine arch? Uh, we will uh, need two to three minutes for the pterygo palatine foramen and everything. Do you, uh, do you okay. permit, sir? Uh, okay, pterygo palatine foramen. Okay, just, just. Yes, I'll try to stroll through. It is a difficult anatomy. Mm -hmm. So, this is the pterygoid plate, okay? Yeah. Yeah. This is the posterior margin of the maxillary, maxillary sinus. Yeah. The Let me zoom this up a bit. Oh, you can see it. Yeah. yeah. The fat plane here in between these is the pterygopalatine foramen. Okay. Okay. So these this has a few extensions as we go superiorly. This is the sphenopalatine, sorry, as we go superiorly. Uh, superiorly, this is the sphenopalatine area, the sphenopalatine recess, and on lateral surface of this is that, excuse me, is the pterygomaxillary fissure. Okay, for uh, any any tumor in the infratemporal fos fossa can get through the pterygomaxillary fissure into the pterygopalatine foramen and. Uh, why are we bothered about this space? Because of few nerves that go through this, the greater and the lesser palatine uh, nerves and the communications. We can see some amount of bony canal here. I will go into another uh, 
view of this, but this is the VDN and I think we will probably get into the coronal. This will be easier for you to understand. So we have this sphenoid and this is the foramen rotundum on either side. Okay. And this is the Vidian canal on either side. So when we have involvement of the tergopalatine foramen here, which is in communication with the Vidian canal here and along the inferior orbital foramen with the foramen rotundum, the entire thing and laterally this communicates with the infratemporal fossa via the pterygomaxillary fissure. The entire structure serves as a highway of spread of tumor or infection and uh, intracranial extension through this is very commonly seen. And uh, if, if we have time, we will go in for another case that shows. Yeah. Uh, no, I the, the think same. we are running out of time. So okay. Okay. We are, uh, just, uh, we, will, we will close this. No, just two things we have to uh, see in the buccal mucosa proper. So yes. buccal mucosa upper is upper part is the orbital rim. So could you please show us so the delegate the orbital rim here? One moment. In the actual section, please. Okay. Sure. So where the maxilla ends superior when we are going this is the inferior part of the maxilla here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and when we go superiorly this ends this is the inferior orbital ridge okay, okay? so the orbit and the retroorbital structures are there we go cranially this is the superior orbital ridge of this is part of the frontal bone and inferiorly this is part of the maxillary bone okay any more questions, Doc? No, I think we have to uh, wrap up round today. up the discussion today uh, because we have another three classes on. Okay, sure, 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 so sure. If whatever the left, I think we are not touching here the uh, maxillary sinus or something. So and perineural spread, I believe. Uh, perineural spread. So we might um, cover it in the next classes. So we will move to the uh, next speaker, Doctor Pita. Uh, over to you. Yes. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you so yes. much. Thank you, everybody. It was lovely talking to you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Shaul. Thank you, Dr. Mojumdar. Uh, before we move on, uh, Doctor, we have a couple of quick questions. Uh, if we could get Dr. Shona Fall, please. Uh, so, Dr. Shweta Divedi have want, has wanted to know the location of the buccinator muscle in a normal scan. By a normal scan, I think she means a non puff cheek scan. And Dr. Subhadra has wanted to know the location of the gingiva buccal sulcus, again, in a non puff cheek scan. Could you please? Uh, can so you give me that. a few seconds? I have uh, signed out from the software that I was using. Just a few seconds. Sure, sir. Uh, Dr. Pritha and Dr. Shonok, this is Dr. Abhishek here. I think it would be better if we could attend to these questions at the later part and now go on with the two talks, if it is not... I, I I think I think so, sir. Because yes. uh, okay. I will I will probably it. send the imaging uh, do, over to Dr. Kostov and he can circulate it in the group. Certainly, he could do that. Or if you could just stay back for a little bit of time, sure. Let us have the two talks, and then we could actually uh, once they address are, the questions. It, then we definitely. could address the questions because definitely, I think sir. There's a difference between questions addressed to you because you will have to actually show them the actual or the coronal. I will do that. I'll do that. While sir. the others won't won't have to show, so we can uh, do it like that. No problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you so sure, sir. So uh, I would quickly move on to the to our second topic, which is a conventional radiotherapy planning in oral cavity and paranasal sinus malignancies. And we are honored to have a Professor Shushmita Ghoshal ma'am with us to discuss this topic. Ma'am, over to you. Uh, shall I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, just a minute. I'm also. Is it visible? Yes, yes ma'am. Ah. Okay, at the outset, I would really like to thank my heartfelt thanks to the West Bengal AROI for keeping academics alive and pertinent and not just merely following uh, what, uh, what is glamorous. Uh, having said that, uh, I am very glad to 
talk about some things that I do day in and day out. It may not be there in the guidelines, but the, there is a method behind my madness, and I would like to explain that to you in the subsequent slide. The, uh, how do I go to the next slide? Uh, madam, can you uh, please start the presentation mode? Wait, 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 wait. I thought I was there. No, it is showing the slide mode, ma'am. Is it okay now? Yes. Uh, right. Uh, is it okay? Yes. Excuse yes. me. Huh? Yes, See? it's moving. Uh, okay. So at the beginning, let's say, why do we need to know all this? Well, the young ones may think that perhaps this is the only way to give a little bit of acknowledgement to old fossils like me. But I would like to also say that what I'm going to tell you today is basically the fundamental concept of radiotherapy, which pertains to head and neck cancers, the sites that we are going to discuss today. And like Dr. Abhishek rightly told you at the beginning, without having a clear idea of this, you will never ever be able to uh, admire or understand what 3D conformal and the, even the IMRT, IGRT, SBRT, what you are getting out of the, the advantages of those things, where it is absolutely required, you will only know when you know the shortcomings of the 2D planning. Of course, as long as you have examiners as old as I am, we will first ask you the 2D. For, so for the junior residents, it is very important to know it properly and say the right words at the right time. Otherwise, people, examiners like me will never be satisfied. I remember taking DNB exams and there were these uh, students from very big uh, corporate hospitals. So whatever, whenever I said, how do you mark the field? They would say two centimeters around the tumor. That is a flat answer for anything that you ask. But honestly speaking, we should know what we are treating, why we are treating, and that, let's see what we do. The next thing is, why is it important to know also your 2D? For the simple reason that people like us who work in a big uh, uh, public, uh, public sector hospital with plenty of patients and very little, uh, very few number of machines that give the high-end machines where you can do. If I could, I would do conformal for each and every patient that crosses my uh, door. However, it is if I start doing this, the earliest date for these will be about three months from the time they register, which is not very good. Therefore, it is very important to find out which are the ones who must have uh, a conformal or a higher conformal radiation and the ones that can do with even with a 2D. So once you know that, you can triage your patients, and then there will not be so much of a rush in your machines. And of course, finally, as a backup, why? Because one day your uh, simulator may conk out. The other day, you may have problems getting casts made. And your patients are not going to just wait there. You won't keep them waiting. You should know how to mark, mark a patient even without the, uh, without the cast being made simply by skin marking, or even actually doing the surface marking in when your simulator is not working. Therefore, a thorough knowledge would help you in the long run. So the subsites that are there in the oral cavity, Kostov was going about a one by one. Uh, of course, lips, oral tongue, buccal mucosa, alveolus, floor of mouth, heart palate, retromolar tricot. Some of them are very common in our daily practice. For example, oral tongue, buccal mucosa, alveolus. Floor of mouth, not that common. Lips, heart palate, isolated retromolar trigon, these are uh, less common tumors. But whatever the tumor we get, after the, all the preliminary workup is done and we have the stage, we should know very well what is the intention of treating. Is it going to be a radical, either only by radiation or as a uh, adjunct to surg uh, surgery, surgery followed by post-op radical radiation, or uh, will this radiation be absolutely palliative? You may do your best, but we, by experience, we all come to know that certain tumors, 
no matter what you do will not be cured at the best we will do palliative if your intention is palliative then it is very easy to do a 2d uh, instead of piling all of them up in the loading your conformal uh, gaps so another reason of radiation is re radiation for recurrence which i am not going to discuss because i do not believe re radiation should be done without conformality so having said that again what do we treat well you may think that all the your gtv ctv etc etc are very new things it was not before we maybe we did not talk in those terms but even in a 2d treatment we know that the primary in head and neck primary tumor along with the draining lymph nodes must be addressed at the same sitting so for the primary tumor all gross tumor with appropriate margins must be included if even if a radical surgery has been done and we have to give post operative radiation the tumor bed as before surgery needs to be and the probable volume of extension of those disease by getting the uh, histo detailed histopath report we know exactly what are that has to be treated even if it is just a metastatic neck node and we do not know where the primary is the possible site of primary for example you have a big uh, level 5 lymph node in the posterior triangle in all probability the primary will be in the nasopharynx so we should the likely primary site should also be included when we are treating the nodes as far as the nodes are concerned all involved nodes has to be concerned so the primary tumor and involved node becomes your gtv that was our gtv all apparently uninvolved nodes of the next aculean will also be have to be because they may be harboring microscopic and the uninvolved contralateral nodes when there was more than when there is more than 20% chance of harboring metastasis they also need to be included even in a 2d so that is somewhat what has been into modern uh, terminology will be ctv1 and ctv2 so after we decide what is the intent uh what, how we uh, and the now how we are going to treat and since my topic is 2d i am going to stick to that uh, but no matter whether it's 2d 3d or whatever you are doing all patients of head and neck cancer they must undergo a pre treatment evaluation of dental hygiene and nutritional status these things are generally not incorporated in our guidelines but we do know that if we want to dental hygiene in most of these patients may be poor and uh, that needs to be addressed even before we start uh, radiation and nutritional status particularly in our country the kind of patients we see they most of them belong to the uh, lower socio economic class the nutritional status may be very compromised so even if you uh, want to treat them radically you have to take care of the, these things also next thing that is very important is immobilization immobilization uh, helps you people all know for constant reproducibility uh, every during the entire treatment and if you have can do a simulation it, that is ideal however up in a place like ours if i send all my patients for simulation then and because i'm not the only one who is treating there are at least uh, 11 others who are also sending their patients so there's a very uh, the, all the patients are clogged that in the simulator and then you have to actually bully each other in order to get some slot in the therefore if i do a proper triaging some patients need not go to simulation they can we can just simply do a skin marking the others particularly the ones the who are going to have a radical treatment should go have an immobilization done and simulation should be done for logistic reason that is what i meant by logistic reason we should can some patients can have only skin marking but for that you know have a, have to have a thorough knowledge of surface marking patients on radiation you just can't mark the patient and let them go or if you better still if you made an immobilization cast you don't even have to remark them but you have to regularly review we generally do it once a week but for patients who are not tolerating very well we can have to do it even more frequently and no matter what we have with prescription we have written at the beginning of treatment depending on the compliance of the patient and the tolerance of the patient 
sometimes these treatment plans need to be modified. This is something what all the younger people must remember that if you, there is no point pumping in radiation to a person who is unable to tolerate it. And therefore, we can change the plan or stop the treatment, whatever is the intervention. For uh, uh, sake of time and rep, uh, to avoid repetition, I'm going to discuss oral tongue and floor of mouth together because as far as the 2D planning is concerned, we mark the fields more or less same. I'm sorry, no, I don't have uh, skin marking for each and every uh, patient because I honestly didn't have time to do that. But uh, for, if I'm going to do only a skin marking, I still have to positioning is very important and I will still require some kind of headrest in order to position the patient. For tongue and floor of mouth, we will use bilateral parallel opposed fields. Why? Because we have to treat both sides of the neck. Why? Because the lymphatic uh, crisscross and uh, there are chances of lymph nodes on both sides, even if they are not clinically palpable. So for skin marking, the superior margin will be from the tragus to ala nasi, and that is the given for most oral tumors. The posterior margin, when we are marking skin marking, is a perpendicular down from the mastoid, from the tip of the mastoid. Anteriorly, we have to cover the anterior because this is not an oropharynx that it is male. We are talking about oral tongue and uh, floor of mouth, which is located anteriorly. We have to cover it adequately. And uh, therefore we have to, uh, now when we are doing this, one practical point is when we examine the patient in a sitting position, you see the anterior extent of the uh, tumor at one place. The same patient in the lying position, the, it will, the tongue will fall back a, li a little and the anterior extent will go back. So if there is scope of uh, simulation, the anterior uh, extent of the tumor may be marked with some kind of radiopic marker. We do not have the guns so the something. Sometimes we do get some a very thick barium paste made and put it in the, mark the anterior part of the tumor, which can be visible in the uh, fluoroscopy. Even if you are not going taking the patient for simulation, you can put your one index finger at the when the patient is lying down, put one index finger and see which is the anterior and find out and uh, which is the uh, corresponding skin area. And you have to take about two centimeters beyond that in order to adequately cover. The inferior should be at the level of the clavicles. It, there's no point taking it below. The shoulders will come in and the radiation will not be effective. So this is something that I pinched from the, uh, I have no details of this patient, so I don't know whether it was going to be spine shielding or the, in all probability, this is a case of during spine shielding. Let me explain the superior border will be above the heart palate when we are, uh, uh, doing it in the floor in the simulator the posterior should have covered the tip of the uh, process of the vertebrae anteriorly you could have said that okay i will cover this and put it in the air in that case we generally don't do that we prefer to just put it just uh, uh, align it with the inner part of the inner table of the mandible why this way we save the lips because the lips are, will not tolerate this radical radiation. We try to avoid that much. And if the lymph nodes are not uh, palpable in 1B, it is 1B region, it is very less likely that 1A lymph nodes will be palpable. So this is how we try to save the lips. The inferior, again, as I said, the clavicle will be the... Now the uh, People, my residents know that when I will not accept anything unless they have gone inside the patient there and made sure that the lower, uh, the lower mark in the simulator that is that they are seeing in the field is actually just grazing the. Uh, so this is something that a uh, practical point when you are doing the. Just don't believe that it. Uh, just you think this is the lower mark. Go and check. And then another thing is since positioning is important. And if there are, 
if supposing we are using a three clamp cast for the head neck uh, for these kind of patients then the lower part of the neck and the shoulders may move from time to time it is very important to retract the shoulders as far down as possible and uh, in uh, and uh, to raise the chin up as uh, in order to get the complete uh, coverage of the neck lobes uh, as we know we have to shield the spinal cord after say 42 it depends on which what your institute does uh, so if you are going to do a skin marking then from the attachment of pinna if you just draw a line perpendicular that is the posterior everything else remains same that is the posterior limb when patients have undergone surgery and they, for a post of tongue and, and with nodes are either there no node or just n1 without any poor prognostic features we also try to reduce the field from below in that way we can spare a little more mucosa as and also sometimes these patients can be taken up for an anterolateral wedge pep because if it, it is if it is well lateralized the supplementary or the boost rt can be given with an anterolateral wedge pep fields which i will discuss later so i'm not talking on not i mean uh, some people they give a uh, posterior uh, uh, neck electron boost for each and every patient we only give to those patients who still have gross disease which are extending to the posterior uh, triangle other than that we do not give uh, 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 electron boost to each and every patient now this is a patient we saw a few days ago she is a case of uh, buccal mucosa uh, carcinoma buccal mucosa who underwent a wide local excision but the neck nodes were not addressed so we have uh, that day our simulator was not working and therefore i had to do the skin marking the skin marking as you were uh, we were discussing the upper gingival buccal sulcus needs to be added therefore i will not do tragus to alanesa i will at least follow the zygoma follow the zygoma for the upper level lower level because the lymph nodes were not although there was no clinical or radiological lymphatic uh, involvement i did not take the risk i have covered at least well the le level 4 and in a both in buccal mucosa and lower alveolus we generally do an anterolateral wedge pair why because the incidence of having contralateral lymph node when the ipsilateral nodes are not palpable or not involved is very little and so we try to save mucosa and the opposite of contralateral parotid this way so how are the marks the fields superior and inferior i said the posterior is again for skin marking it is down from the uh, tip of the mastoid and the anterior of the lateral field it is in the air because it is going to uh, in, uh, intersect with the anterior field in air therefore we don't draw the common uh, uh, margin here we instead we make this the center of the lateral field has to be marked and this is the anterior field again the upper superior and inferior they correspond to the lateral fields the uh, the lateral line of the anterior field will be just across the angle of mouth on the opposite side and here again we will not draw the medial uh, line because it is going to be in air just intersecting with the lateral view and we draw the uh, center like this mark the center this is how we can make sure that uh, this is reproduced every time and uh, we uh, every time the mark becomes uh lighter we have to mark it uh, darken it before it goes off totally the same thing can be done in the simulator when we do it in the simulator i always find it easy to begin with the lateral field because that is easier to um, match the uh, upper and lower and then after that i go to the anterior field lip uh costo began with lip but we don't see too many lips for lip cancers if they are small t1 t2 lesions uh 
they may be treated by radiation but if it is going to be radical radiation i think the best way to do it would be uh, brachytherapy but since that is not in this today's thing i will not go into details if you are not doing brachytherapy a, bed, a very good way of treating these will be by with electrons now when we are treating with electrons we must remember uh, that the electron uh, field sizes that come along with the applicators they are finite they come in but the tumors are don't come in that they come in different shape and sizes therefore you have to make a lead cut out which suits the size of the tumor or the area that we are going to treat this we have to make locally and then we appropriate choose the appropriate energy the appropriate uh, by finding out exactly how much we are going to radiate and that is and the physicist will calculate it for you what uh, radiation has to be given and there are standard uh, ways of doing it I, that is more of theory i will not go into it let's talk about the unknown primary the so called unknown primary with the metastatic neck nodes don't accept any unknown primary as unknown primary until you have made sure that all thorough examinations have been done and these days people actually come with a pet done when they can't find the pet however uh, once you have these the real unknown primary remember what are the probable sites so that throat lymph node metastasis there are nasopharynx tonsil and uh, base of tongue in the oropharynx and hypopharynx these are the notorious primary sites to throw uh, neck nodes and uh, which may not uh, which may precede the actual primary tumor so after we have looked for them and we have not found we have to make sure th what is the intention of the tumor if it is radical intent we may as well treat the nodes as well as the possible primary site like i have mentioned before so therefore the field markers will be according to the assumed primary site be it, be it nasopharynx or hypopharynx whatever we think should be the primary for post we have certain patients of unknown primary who get the surgery done and come to us for and if post op radiation is indicated because of the poor prognostic factors it is no i mean i consider it a uh, visor to include the probable site of primary along with the uh, nodal sites because if supposing we treat the uh, post we give post op radiation to the neck and do not give uh, radiation to the post and tomorrow some it, the thing crops up it becomes difficult to treat that therefore routinely we generally include the probable site of the primary if you think that the intent is palliative the next thing is look at the performance status the age uh, the nutrition of the patient and if they are good performance status then a younger patient then the field markings will be like the radical cases only however the dose will be uh, it makes sense to give hypofractionated radiation assess the patients how they are responding to radiation and if they show good response we can always top it up with some supplementary radiation however for poor performance status multiple comorbidities we only radiate the gross nodal mass here don't go from nasopharynx like uh, the marking of 2.5 cm above the zygoma to the clavicle it is pointless see because the patient itself is has multiple comorbidities or has poor performance status if you are going to irradiate so much mucus they are only going to worsen with the radiation they will never feel the uh, palliative effect of radiation therefore for such patients just treat the gross nodal mass if it is isolated to one side then give radiation only to the one side you can turn the face to the op opposite side and give a direct anterior field however if you think that it is something like a nasopharynx then perhaps the entire neck and also the supraclav region needs to be uh, treated this is how things used to be done previously this is my cpr tinted book uh, tinted book and this is the only field that i could find out but you have to remember the that those days the dictum was you give two parallel opposed uh, lateral fields for the upper neck and you give a lower anterior field 
uh, to cover adequately the supraclav region. However, we know because of divergence of the beams, there will be certain areas of hotspot. In order to uh, prevent that, uh, shields were put either in the anterior field or in the lateral field. However, with the kind of patient load that we have and the dedication of some of our, not all, but some of our, or the lack of dedication, I'd rather say, of some of our staff, if you make the treatment uh, too complicated, there's very chance, there's every chance that it will be something uh, will go, something will be upset and some wrong treatment may happen. In order to keep it simple, it, as long as possible, we give only two parallel opposed lateral uh, fields right up to the clavicle whenever possible. One way of avoiding uh, Avoiding the divergence of beam is to use a common isocenter for both the upper field and the lower field and use a half beam block such that the, uh, this will be a straight line. The junction of the upper and the lower field will be a straight line. Why? Because that is where the central axis passes through. That is one way of doing in the modern machines. But remember in our older cobalt machines, this was not possible. However, I think this has almost become obsolete now because no, none of the new technicians know about this. Now, what is more important, what we could have discussed with Dr. Paul in the previous thing is the paranasal sinus. As far as uh, 2D radiation for paranasal sinus, I would do it only for some uh, maxillary sinus patients. For all the spinoid sinus, uh, the ethmoids, etc. Just like uh, like all our nasopharynx, I will definitely ask for conformal radiation because it is very difficult to actually do a justice to the patient and the tumor by doing only a 2D. However, let's talk about this, particularly for the junior residents, it is going to be very important for your exams. So first of all, let's talk about the skin marking. Although I don't have the skin marking here, but again, there are anterior lateral wedge pair has to be used. Anterior, uh, anterior field, lateral field. The superior border of the anterior field when your skin marking will be the super, uh, superior orbital ridge. The inferior will be the angle of mouth. We must remember that the maxillary uh, Antrum, it points a bit low. It, we don't keep it at the level of the heart palate. We have to go down below. Why? Because it points downwards. Therefore, angle of uh, mouth should be the minimum. If you want it, it can be a little bit lower also, but definitely uh, heart palate is definitely not the uh, lower bone. The lateral will be uh, the inner canthus of the opposite eye, the, la uh, the field that uh, the margin that will be uh, along with the lateral border will be uh, flashed just outside the body. Uh, and again, we will just draw the center here. The lateral, the superior and inferior will match. Posteriorly, we cover the mastoid. Anteriorly, the lateral orbital, uh, that is here also it is the same thing. The bony, uh, the lateral bony canthus is the uh, margin for the anterior field as well as the, sometimes if we do put uh, 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 some kind of radiopic markers in the, in the lateral canthus, particularly when we are using uh, cast, when we won't not be able to find out, we can put uh, radiopic markers in the lateral, outer bony canthus just to show about this. So these are the standard markings of a paranasal sinus, uh, of a maxillary sinus. Let's keep it to the maxillary sinus. And there are certain points to remember in which, because we are treating from the same anterolateral fields are used, we have to use a beam modification device like a wedge filter. 
in order to give uniform dose distribution. Generally, we will not treat the neck nodes. If the neck nodes need to be treated, I prefer to use a separate field for the neck nodes, even when we are doing a 2D planning. Most important is shielding of the ipsilateral eye as indicated, and in the next slide I will show that. We must remember that the opposite, now if you have to treat the ipsilateral eye, at least the opposite lens can be spared. And this is done by giving what we call a posterior tilt to the lateral beam, so that the lens of the opposite eye is not, uh, comes in the path of the divergent beam. We must also remember sometimes the patients that come to us with maxillary, they have involvement of the skin. So whenever required, we have to ha use a bolus. Don't forget to use that. The bolus depends, even a wet cotton bolus will do. If you are treating this patient with a cast, then using dental wax to make the bolus is adequate. And another very important thing which have to be, you have to be checked for practical, both for exam purpose and for day-to-day -day practice is, if the, you are treating a patient of CA maxilla, which is, has been operated, the post-operative cavity must be filled with a tissue equivalent material for, to give the dose, proper dose distribution within the cavity. Otherwise, if it is only filled with air, you will never get that kind of dose distribution. In our institute, we generally use acroflavin soaked uh, some kind of the sponges. Some people use water bags inside, but please make it a point to see, even if some of the patients will come with an obturator already there, but please make it a point to see whether there is some packing material in the operator, operated uh, cavity. If not, send the patient back to the surgeon to get it filled. Now, what do I mean by posterior tail? I, this is definitely not a patient of CA maxilla, but this was the one on the, in the machine. Like, if you are giving a lateral field, the gantry angle is 270. But here, we are giving a 275. So that is a little bit raised, 5 degree raise as compared to a uh, uh, lateral field. And that way, what happens, the beam that will come will go like this and spare the contralateral lens. These are the eye shields that I was talking about. Now, as you can see, this is a block. There are five HBL blocks. And this is something which we call as a pencil shield. When to use what? If Dr. Paul assures me that there is absolutely no involvement of the, or of the orbit, of the ipsilateral orbit, then we will use a five edge wheel block, rectangular block to cover the orbit totally. But if he, after seeing the CT scans, even the pre-op CT scans, has comments that there is minor uh, erosion, some erosion of the floor of the orbit or maybe the medial wall of the orbit, then we cannot use this kind of block. In that case, what can we shield? We can shield the cornea and the lens of the ipsilateral line. And that is why this pencil shield, which is actually a circular shield, this is used and the cornea and the uh, lens will be shielded and safe. However, most of our patients have gross involvement of the uh, orbit, of the ipsilateral orbit. In that case, even this cannot be used. So what will we do? We will ask the patient, to look into the beam. What are we saving that way? At least the cornea will be saved because otherwise there will be painful blindness if we don't do that. So that we have to make sure that the patient, now we are using mega voltage radiation, the maximum dose will be below the surface and the cornea can be saved. We often have a patients who have, because of neurological deficit or maybe surgery or something, they can't even keep that eye open. In that case, the upper eyelid has to be retracted and taped such that the patient can actually look into the beam. These things are small things, minor things, but it goes a long way in giving good quality radiation, even if you have only a cobalt machine. This is an exercise which all our residents must do. They hate it, but we make them do it. 
Why do we make them do it? This gives us simple understanding. Now this is a maxilla which is being treated by anterior field and a lateral field. They are open fields without wedges. So what happens? You mark, draw the isodoses on both fields. Wherever they are intersecting those points, we know we will add uh, the value of this and the value of this, and we will have multiple points. And when we join the points which have the same value, this is what the outcome is like. It ranges from 185% to 135% in the area of interest. So we see that there will be a hotspot, which will cause a lot of radiation induced damage, and there will be a cold spot, which will lead to uh, a residual disease or a recurrence of disease. Which, so this does not make sense. What we need is a, some kind of uh, homogeneous distribution in this part. So what do we do? We insert wedges. Wedges are beam modification devices. So the isotoses, uh, the distribution will change. And when we do the same exercise once more, we will have a more or less, since this is not a very good uh, example, but because they have been done uh, grossly by uh, manually, it is just to give you an idea how at least uh, it is more uniform as compared to the previous one. Now, one question that the all uh, JRs must remember is, how do we play? This is my pet question I will always ask, and I often find victims of this when they can't place the wedges properly. Must remember, when in this, this kind of situation, simplest thing to remember is put the thick edges together. That is how you, if you have access to the uh, TPS, when you have a board, try to experiment with all kinds of uh, wedges, putting them on different ways and see how things can. Be. Now, one more thing that why the importance of knowing these things is when we have the young physics students, the interns, and the MSc students who come and plan, they also put the wedges in the wrong direction and they can give you horrible uh, uh, things. So unless you know what it should look like in a 2D, how are you going to check your 3D? So that is why I think 2D is still important for your basic concept. Another technique for, and this we have used to do in nasopharynx, which went anteriorly or maxillary sinus that went posteriorly to the posterior ethmoids. So if you give only an anterolateral field, the anterior field is not unable to give adequate dose. So instead of that, a three field technique with an open anterior field and two parallel uh, uh, fields, lateral fields with wedges, which were used as compensators uh, were used. And also another thing that we can do is give different weightage to each beam such that, and you can play with the weighting till you get the adequate or good kind of coverage. This can be done. This we used to do standard whenever we needed to, the dose to go more posteriorly instead of being here. I think this is the last one. I tried to tell you the reasoning why we why we do things the way we do. And I thank you for a patient uh, hearing. I welcome any question. And Shinjini Chakraborty has already raised her hand. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your comprehensive talk and such discussion of such important uh, issues. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, I would go one by one. Uh, Dr. Nikhila wanted to know that, like you mentioned uh, in... Uh, Tongue cancers or throat of mouth cancers, the superior border is at the level of the tragus. So is it always at the level of the tragus or is there any modification See, you would want to do? Yes. See, if I'm going to do 2D and I don't have a simulator, it will be tragus to alanazine. Okay. Okay. But if I have a simulator and I'm taking the patient to the simulator, I will not... Uh, yes, that is where I will roughly... I will keep the upper level like there. I'll put the setup there, go to and see the fluoro and see what, uh, and I, I will, it is not, if I, you have access to a simulator, this, that is what triggers to Alanazine will only be your uh, starting point. 
and our patients come in all shapes and sizes and whatever covers the uh, hard palate will be your upper limb. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are quite a few questions regarding the low anterior neck heel. So first of all, I would want to ask what Dr. Joita wanted to know that in a, uh, in a patient with a CA tongue with level three and four lymph node positive, Mm -hmm. Would you prefer two parallel opposed fields or would you want to do a three field technique with a low anterior field as well? Surgery done or not done? Uh, she has not mentioned uh -huh. that. See, <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm saying. As I said, right in the beginning, I make up my mind whether it is a radical intent or palliative intent. If yes, surgery has not been done, then honestly speaking, this is only a palliation. Okay. Okay. You have multiple nodes. In the neck node. Yes, yes. Surgery has not been done either for the primary or the neck nodes. Okay. Yes, okay. So that's a palliative setting we are talking yeah. about. Okay. You can give chemo radiation as much as you want to. Okay. Ultimately, it will be palliation. Okay. Anyway, and the second thing, if we are talking about level four also, yes. When we are giving a lower anterior field, the dictum is you will not cut through any palpable lymph nodes. Yes. And because that will be the margin. Okay, if I'm yes. going to, if the upper limit of my anterior uh, field is where, at the, say, the uh, thyroid notch. Yes. Okay. Or the picothyroid groove, yeah. yes. And so, and you have a level three lymph node, you have a level four lymph node, they will not be adequately covered. Okay. So not you will cut through the, you will cut okay. through the lymph node that is there in the neck, okay? And okay. that will be in the margin, it will be underdosed. Okay. So, uh, ah, that's how, so I, th that is how so, I think. Okay. So, if it's possible to give two parallel opposed fields and cover the whole volume, like you said, we would want yeah. to do that. Yes. Okay. So, what uh, we will do, and one of my colleagues had once made a very simple way of uh, just retracting uh, a very simple thing, a rubber tube kind of thing. If you pull that thing, the, shoul uh, the shoulders would automatically go down as much as possible and I said that way you can cover as the entire neck without a uh, problem like even a level four with at least two centimeter margin definitely will be covered and if you go down to the unless the uh, neck is very short or something okay uh, now coming to uh, the matching between the low anterior cervical neck field and the parallel opposed fields uh, so you have already mentioned if we can do a single ascender technique, we can do that. Anything yeah. else we can do uh, in yes. uh, matching? As mentioned in the books, I couldn't find the diagram. I was trying to find the picture. The whole day I've been looking for that picture, couldn't find it. Uh, that is, you can change the collimator angle and you can uh, uh, turn the couch away from the collimator. Okay. 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 So that okay. is one way. That is how you make both the lines parallel, like the upper end of the lower uh, lower field and the lower end of the lateral field. Mm. I've been looking for the and obviously I can't draw it myself. I couldn't find the picture. It but it has been described that if you for that both the couch has, you the, should be able to move and the collimator has to be rotated such that both of them will become parallel that is one way of doing it it is written in textbooks the older okay. uh, planning books and uh, honestly speaking i have also never done it none of my existing technicians have ever done it they don't even remember doing anything like that okay thank you uh, and what is the depth uh, to which you prescribe the dose for a low anterior neck normally uh, see if you, in today's world we have ct scan data at yes. least the previous uh, so we count from there. Otherwise, a three centimeter would be, uh, uh, this is a uh, year of thumb, a rule of thumb. Okay. If you have the CT scan, pre-op CT scans or the CT scans before treatment, you can jolly well measure it and make sure exactly where you want to give it. Otherwise, okay. if unspecific, then I will give about say three centimeters. Okay, three centimeters. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Oringa wanted to know that if the lateral border of the anterior neck field is intercepting with the medial border of the parallel opposed lateral fields, mm -hmm. then how do we uh, manage that situation? Wait, let me see. If, where did I go? 
Yeah, this one. Can I? Uh, yes. My scene, huh? Yes. See, this is the lateral. Okay. Yes. I know. I hope you are able to. This is lateral, and the this is the divergent anterior. Okay. Okay. Yes. So these are the areas. The book says that you have to put a shield in the lateral field. Yes. And in the anterior, of course, this is the you are shielding the lungs. See, this is how they are trying to. Okay. Show. Yes, ma'am. You have already explained it. Thank you so much, ma'am. There are a few other questions. I would try to get back to you if you uh, could stay with us till the end of the presentations, and I would. Uh, today I don't have to cook, so I can stay. Home. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, moving on due to time constraint, we'll discuss the other questions later if we can. To Dr. Onupam Dattu, who is a consultant radiation oncologist at the Netaji Shubhash Chandra Cancer Institute, who would be talking to us about the conformal RT planning techniques in CA oral cavity and paranasal sinus malignancies. Over to you, Dr. Dattu. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, and can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, West Bengal chapter, for uh, this particular, uh, uh, you know, class on uh, 2D, 3D, 2D, and 3D planning techniques in uh, uh, across all the sites. And I'm and I'm I must say I'm very overwhelmed and privileged to be a part of this particular uh, academic evening. So and. Uh, at the outset, I would also like to thank our radiologist, Dr. Shonov and uh, Smita, madam, for making my life so damn easy because I would have tried to explain many things, but you have done that part already and that would cut down my presentation. So before starting off, I would like to start off with this particular disclaimer that neck nodal contouring per se slice by slice will be dealt with in the next class. And I will be, as madam has already mentioned, for uh, oral cavity re uh, regions and for uh, uh, parallel sinuses, radical CTRTs, you know, are like palliative. So I would be giving more importance to the post of cases here than the inoperable ones. So the agenda for this, I will be covering the these four uh, uh, heads. And first of all, why we need a conformal RT uh, treatment alone in uh, in uh, kidney cancers. What are the steps of conformal radiotherapy treatment in kidney cancers? What are the concepts of uh, you know target volume delineation or contouring that we say in our day-to-day -day, uh, life, and of course some case-based examples that I'll be discussing. So the first thing you know what exactly is conformal radiotherapy and how it is you know uh, superior to a two D treatment. So if we say the two D versus three D representation, you need to understand that this is a classical example of uh, of a particular N of a particular organ at risk, which is lodged into the concavity of a particular tumor. And you can treat this tumor with two with an anterolateral beam pair or two oblique anteriors, but eventually you will end up firing the OAR over here. So in order to spare the OAR, and that is when we need to treat the concavity out and spare the OAR, we need conformal radiotherapy. Let's take this analogy again. So say, for example, this yellow uh, uh, ellipse is our tongue and which has two parotids and the spinal cord at the back. Now, if we treat by opposed laterals, what we'll find is this, the two parotids completely getting fired during this treatment. But, and we'll end up, and the, and the patient will end up with more xerostomia for the rest of his life. If we, if conformal radiotherapy, we are substantially sparing out our parotids. The spinal cord was already spared earlier and we are completely treating our tongue. So what happens is tumor doses are often higher than the tolerance doses of the OERs in head and neck cancers. And this is what I wanted to show you. See, these are the OERs, the organs at risk when we treat our head neck cancers. So whatever be the head neck, especially in our uh, oral cavity and uh, paralysal sinuses, of which these are the serial OARs. Serial OARs are the organs at risk in which at any point, if you cross the normal tissue tolerance, the 
downstream function of that particular organ at risk is jeopardized. This is as simple as a series circuit that we, you know, studied in our physics. And then comes the parallel OERs. Of course, lens is a serial OER. I beg, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm sorry that I can include it here. So the parallel OERs are the ones wherein the functional and structural units are independent of each other. So if at a particular point you are firing more dose, the rest of the organ is going to take care of the function. But the main problem is that the tumoricidal dose of a tumor in locally advanced setting is 66 to 70 gray, while in post-op, which is, is 60 gray, which means the tumoricidal dose is actually higher than the normal tissue constraints of these organs at risk. So, so even if it is an early disease, if we are not using conformal techniques, we are more or less likely to jeopardize the normal functions of any of these organs at risk. So in short, why do we need conformal radiotherapy in head neck cancers, mostly in oral cavity? In order to reduce the organ at risk dose, to allow dose escalation, sometimes we need to boost. So in order to allow dose escalation without increasing the late toxicity in local, local regionally advanced disease, now the concept is today we are living in an era of adaptive radiotherapy wherein with course of treatment, if the disease shrinks, you can adapt your tumors or your target volumes accordingly so that you end up firing less OAR. And lastly, re-irradiation. Madam has already told that she is not a proponent of re-irradiation with 2D techniques. So conformal therapy is the choice of treatment for re-irradiation. -ir the most important part of re-radiation is that if a patient in first, uh, initially gets treated with a conformal therapy, his those parameters to the tumor, to the other OARs are stored in the system. So which, which, which means that when we re-radiate, we already have uh, the calculations in place as to which OAR has received what dose previously. In short, we need conformal radiotherapy to increase tumor control and to decrease side effects, thereby increasing the therapeutic ratio of the treatment. So what are the steps of conformal radiotherapy? So before we start of conformal radiotherapy, you should always have a pre-planning checklist ready with you. And then you should move ahead with your planning or simulation. Or in the book, what is we call as image acquisition. So in the pre-planning checklist, as Madam has already mentioned, what is most important is that you need a proper documentation to your clinical examination of the tumor and the nodal status, number one. You should have a proper documentation of the ECOG or the Karnowski performance status of the patient because a poor performance status will, patient will never ever tolerate a radical or a, you know full dose uh, RT or CTRT. Dental hygiene, nutritional status, very, very important. Surgical histopathology report is of utmost importance here because the histology, the, the pathological tumor size, the depth of invasion, they all, the, uh, you, know, uh, it's, uh, you know, they change the uh, staging of the disease. Lymphovascular and uh, perineural invasion, because if you have a perineural invasion positive, your treatment parameters change once again. Then pathological nodal involvement, the levels of lymph nodal involvement that has to be specifically mentioned in the surgical history panel, and of course, extra nodal extension or extra capsular extension positivity. So if there is extra capsular extension, we all know we need to add a CTRT instead of an RT. We define the treatment dose and fractionation then, and then we define our simulation parameters as to how we are going to simulate those patients. So in your pre-planning audit, all these things has to be ticked in the respective checkbox. The simulation is, the head and neck simulations are more or less the same, but only difference in the oral cavities are, I have mentioned here, you know, you have a supine position for all head and neck cancers. The neck position has to be mentioned. Usually for head and neck and for paranasal sinuses, we use a neutral neck position. The arm position for all head and neck cancers is usually by the side of the body. You need to use a mouth bite specifically for tongue and heart palate uh, cancers in order to separate out the tongue away from the heart palate, thereby preventing a dose buildup in that area at the junction of the palate and the tongue. 
and of course whether or not you want to use a shoulder retractor based on the build of the patient so that you don't end up firing the humor of arms or you end up don't end up underdosing your lower neck nodal regions you define the field of view the field of view for uh, oral cavity cancers are usually from the base of skull to carina we in our institute take 2.5 to 3 mm cuts for the ct scan the window settings are traditionally devised at media channel window and we use a contrast for 1 to 1.5 mm per kg body weight depending upon the 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 egfr of the patient and giving a 25 to 30 seconds delay for the contrast this is the complete simulation parameter so the steps of other steps is then once we take the images we transfer the images to the tps we import the images then in our tps then we start target volume delineation or contouring and then comes the after we have contoured we prescribe the volumes and the planning and optimization is taken care of either in a forward or in an inverse manner by our physicist team once the plan is ready we evaluate the plan in two ways uh, qualitative in the form of a color wash and the quantitative by understanding the dvh parameters then uh, once we approve the plan a quality assurance is being done again by the physicist team and after the quality assurance is approved then we do a plan implementation or the setup verification we go into the the to in, in the machine you know we stand up by the couch side and we see the shifts being applied and lastly treatment delivery so this is in short of the steps of the conformal radiotherapy and this is what exactly i wanted to show you you do a thorough clinical examination immobilize the patient do the simulation transfer the images to tps do the contourings generate a 3d model then you start the planning and of course towards the end a qa and followed by a treatment delivery the target volumes then we have the gtv the ctv and the ptv gtv is nothing but the grossly involved tumor or the the gross tumor or the involved lymph nodes ctvs are usually the areas of microscopic spread and we have the high risk ctv the intermediate risk ctv and the low risk ctv based on their risk factors of you know failures so the high risk ctvs are usually the ctvs with the involved regions of the uh, tumors the intermediate ctvs are the next echelon uh, lymph nodal regions or the next echelon anatomical sites wherein the chances of the macroscopic spread is the highest and the low risk ctv is nothing but the elective nodal areas and of course we give a ptv margin and that margin is purely institutional for setup and motion errors but remember always contour your organs at risk first because if you contour your organs at is uh, risk at the last you have a very high chance of underestimating your oar contour in order to accommodate your ptv contours and that way you would end up firing more dose to your oars your dvh will look very good but the clinical outcome will be very poor in that case in that case on that note uh, again so the gtv is nothing but clinical we do a wire delineation and the radiological gross disease usually on a very basic way ctv high risk is a uh, gtv plus 0.5 to 1 cm along with the involved lymph nodal regions ctv intermediate risk is the next echelon or the adjacent lymph nodal regions after the high risk it may be ipsilateral for well lateralized buccal mucosa or contralateral for tongue or midline buccal mucosa lesions and of course the ctv low risk is nothing but the elective lymph nodal region which is again adjacent or next echelon to the intermediate risk or ctv of everything always remember to crop out your ctv from oars muscles and bone bones unless they are infiltrated the reason being microscopic disease cannot cross anatomical barriers this is very very important this is like a uh, you know a uh, statement on a piece of stone that your microscopic disease will never cross your anatomical barrier to so always crop your ctv out of oars muscles and bones the ptv will be the ctv x, uh, 0.5 to 0.7 expansion uh, says a centimeter uh, mm sorry it's so 5 to 7 mm it should be a centimeter over here uh, based on your institutional protocol now your ptv don't try and edit your ptv if your ptv is in the air say for example in pns in oral cavity or in nasal cavity or in the airway don't edit that ptv you can only edit the ptv out of your body contour but not if the ptv goes into the air 
so coming on to some you know basic guidelines and this is one of the be- uh, very basic guidelines by gregor in 2000 and he said that you should include for oral cavity lesions only level 1 to level 3 lymph nodes apart from the uh, post op areas and you include the level 4 lymph node for anterior tongue in case of n0 to n2a while include all the levels of lymph node if there is you know uh, n to b disease so you should also include the level 5 lymph node md anderson says that for definitive radiotherapy you your your ctv high risk is the gross tumor with margins based on your you know clinical and radiological features your intermediate risk uh, ctv would be the the just uh, you know the lymph nodal stations we are which are adjuvant just adjacent or next echelon to your high risk ctv and your low risk ctv would be your elective nodal region while for post of uh, radiotherapy uh, in you have a high risk and an intermediate risk based on the extra capsular extension so your post op uh, ctv's high risk ctv would be your surgical bed and the lymph nodal region involvement while your, there is no low risk there is only a, a intermediate risk ctv in post op cases and that is nothing but the elective lymph nodal regions so in definitive uh, rt imrt or whatever uh, conformal technique we are practicing there are three risk ctvs while for post op cases there are two risk ctvs until otherwise you know we have some uh, poor uh, factors like positive margins i have been trained in jitmer and you know in my institute uh, at netaji subhash chandra bose we practice this particular uh, uh, you know uh, <coughs> our way of uh, practice and that is you know for definitive radiotherapy the gtv is a gross tumor while for the node positive cases the gross tumor and involved lymph nodes the ctv high risk for definitive we give 66 grain 30 fraction by abraham miles bridge protocol and that is gtv plus 5 mm margin along with ipsilateral nodal level at the highest risk of failure while for n plus we give gtv plus 0.5 cm margin along with the entire affected nodal level and at adj- uh, the adjacent next echelon lymph nodes ipsilateral or contralateral based on the high risk of failure the intermediate risk ctv is usually at 60 gray 30 fractions and we the next echelon lymph nodes are the ones which are included in that and the elective lymph nodal uh, lymph nodes are included in the 54 gray 30 fraction or the low risk ctv and we give a ptv margin of 5 mm over our ctvs and we crop out 3 mm from the body contour for post operative cases the ctv high risk is 60 gray 30 fraction and in an n0 cases we would include the entire post operative bed including a flap if has been done for a node uh, positive lymph node we will include the entire post op bed along with the flap and the affected lymph nodal levels as i have already said in your pre planning checklist you should know which all levels are involved in the uh, in your histopathology in in the surgical histopath based on that say for example level 2 is involved you would include level 2 in 60 gray volume so the ctv intermediate risk or the 54 to 30 fraction uh, risk would be the next echelon lymph nodes which are free so you yeah, that becomes an elective lymph nodal volumes so in case of tongue we would irradiate bilaterally as madam has already said because our principles don't change the principles of radiotherapy will not change with the technique because eventually our all 3d uh, 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 fundamentals are derived from uh, 2d and you know so if it's a tongue involvement you need to irradiate bilateral neck if it's a lateral well lateralized buccal mucosa you need to irradiate the unilateral neck and neck you would only irradiate when the chance of lymph nodal involvement is more than 20% which is for t2 in tongue and t3 in buccal mucosa this i have not mentioned here but this you know you can hear me out and that is the dictum in post op cases we rarely give a 66 gray or a definitive dose of therapy except in margin positive disease in an r1 resection or if we find that in a post op neck nodal region there is a suspected gross node and the surgeon is not willing to do a further neck resection or the patient is not willing to undergo the knife once again so in such cases we give this particular volume in a post operative setting as i have already said our ptv margins would be 5 mm 
to the respective CTV and we would crop out 3 mm from the body. Now, the most important part, your perineural invasion would be mentioned in the histopath report. So if the perineural invasion is positive, you have to understand that you have to include the entire track of the that particular nerve till the base of the skull and include that in 54 grip volume. Certain institutes include that in the high risk or the 60 gray volume, but we do it in the 54 gray volume. So this is a case of a CA tongue and this is how we do it. And uh, you know, you, you put in uh, the patient in a neutral neck, put the fiducials at the chin. Now remember, where do we put a fiducial for a particular tumor? You would put the fiducial as close to the site you are irradiating. So that would ensure minimal shifts. Minimal shifts means minimal errors. So if it is a tongue or a buccal mucosa, try and put the uh, fiducial at the chin. If it is a paranasal sinus, put it at the glabella. We use a mouth bite. You know, ideally you would use dental amalgam and very nice mouth bite is prepared. But you know, we have the Indian jugad and uh, we have a hack wherein we use a 10 cc syringe and that separates the, the tongue from the uh, heart palate. The field of view, as I've already mentioned, is a base of skull to carina with 2.5 mm cuts in our uh, setup. And of course, for all cases, be it post-op or be it radical, we will always give contrast for our patients. So let's take this particular case as an example. So this was a case of a CA tongue who underwent upfront surgery. And after that, the tumor was, it was a pathological T2N0, the lymphovascular invasion and perineural invasion was negative. So what do the present guidelines say? Your high risk CTV or 60 gray CTV should include the post-op region, entire post-op region. And when we include the entire post-op region of the CA tongue, remember, you would also include the level 1B bilaterally with that because when the surgeon removes a part of the tongue, then remember they also remove the level 1B lymph nodes in the same incision. So which is why you should include the entire post-op cavity, uh, post-op area in, uh, along with the level 1B. And this is where we are treating the bilateral neck nodes. See, you have, you have taken the neck nodes up to level, the, up to the posterior end of the sternocleidomastoid covering the level two, level three, and level four. We have not included level five over here because it's a T2N0. Had this been an N2D disease, we would have also included the level five. And of course, see, the, this, the flap has been reconstructed till the floor of mouth. And so we have also included the floor of mouth in our high-risk CTV. Parallelly, the elective lymph nodal re, uh, volumes are also going down till the level four lymph nodes. So in short, the CTV-60 included the post of primary, including the entire uh, tongue up to floor of mouth, and the CTV-54 included bilateral level 2 to level 4 lymph nodes. We go to another case, and this is a case of sear right buccal mucosa. Post neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it was inoperable up front. Then the patient underwent two cycles of TPF regimen. After post-surgery, then underwent surgery, and it was a YPT3N2B disease. The levels of lymph node involved were, were level two and level four. Extracapsular extension was positive. Lymphovascular invasion uh, embolus uh, and uh, LV and PNI were negative. So what we did here was that this is your the post of uh, uh, the cranial most slice of your post of uh, cavity, post of area, uh, post of PTV. So we have gone high up till the uh, infratemporal fossa. One one person has asked me whether uh, can I be heard? Hello? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. sir, you're audible. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this, uh, someone asked in the, like, do we have to include till the zygomatic process? So if you go to the high uh, ITF, to the ITF, you automatically include the uh, zygomatic process, zygoma. So this is no different from 2D again. And this is how the post-op area I have covered. And now it is a level N to B disease. So you can see this is where I have covered the level five lymph node over here at the anterior bottom of the trapezius. So I have covered the entire thing under one CTV till level four. Now my entire volume was 60 gray volume. Why? Because you see the lymph nodal uh, regions involved were level two and level four with extra capsular extension. So 
rarely you can have a level 3 spared with an extra capsular invasion you cannot have a spared level 3 sitting in between level 2 and level 4 and remember the surgeon removes level 2 to 4 in one single incision so he has already seeded microscopic disease into level 3 so you cannot afford to spare level 3 as an elective lymph node also the entire thing comes within your 60 gray or high risk volume this is a case of an upper alveolar ridge maxillary uh, left uh, maxillary alveolar ridge where it's a inoperable disease pt4 n0 so it's an operable upfront operated with pt4 n0 the reason i have included this particular uh, slide was to show that pni was positive so in the maxilla we have the maxillary nerve and that is how they have covered the maxillary nerve till the base of the skull so you can see the ctv covering the maxillary nerve this is they have included in the lower ctv so this is the you know obturator because after uh, we remove the maxilla the we put in uh, the prosthodontist puts in a, an obturator to cover up the maxillary defect so the obturator also comes into your post op ctv so the ctv high risk would include the post op primary and obturator and ctv intermediate risk takes care of the left level to 4 and the neural foramina of cranial of the maxillary nerve. Now we come to the paranasal sinus malignancies. And in paranasal sinus malignancies, again, we need to look into the pre-planning aspect of that and the simulation. In pre-planning, remember, the paranasal sinuses, they are unique because they have different histologies, like, uh, like uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma, especially neuroblastomas, and uh, um, uh, the especially neuroadenoid cystic carcinomas, they are always uh, you know positive for pni because even if they are negative we should consider them positive for pni the while the especially neuroblastomas they have a tendency to involve the cribriform and the anterior cranial fossa very early uh, can you just give me a second time because it's something has gone wrong um, Hello, you are not audible. Uh, sir, I think uh, I think uh, he has some uh, personal issues for one to two minutes, so he will come back soon, I guess. Yeah, sorry, I'm extremely sorry. Uh, so uh, somebody knocked at the door. Okay, so this is what it is. Uh, so the histology plays a very very uh, major role. Even if you the adin the PNI is negative for adenoid cystic carcinomas, always consider it positive. And for especially neuroblastomas, do include the cribriform and the anterior cranial fossa because they have this uh, you know tendency to involve them very very early. The simulation part is the field of view should be you know vertical to carina. And the, for maxilla, uh, we need to keep a mouth bite in order to keep the tongue away. IV contrast is usually preferred because of the close proximity to our, our target to visual apparatus. And as I've already said, your fiducial should always be very, very near to your uh, 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 target because preferably, you know, that is because that would ensure lesser shifts. So fiducials, we, for uh, paranasal sinuses, we usually keep at the glabella. So these are the contouring or the target volume guidelines for a paranasal sinus malignancy. So for both ethmoid and maxilla, the CTV66 would be if it has been resected out the positive margin area. For CTV60 or the high response, we have cribriform for the ethmoidal regions. We have the cribriform plate if it is not resected. And remember, if an uh, ethmoid is operated, they also do an uh, anterior, uh, you know, craniotomy. And so we should include the dura and the dura graft. We should also include the inferior turbinate, the nasal cavity, the ipsilateral maxilla, and the sphenoid sinus for the ethmoidal regions. For maxilla, we should go at least one centimeter superior to the pre of gross disease. And for the adenoid cystic regions, we should go till the skull base. We should include the inferior border of the maxilla along with the part palate as our inferior, the, the, the cranial most contours. 
nasal septum should be included if the maxilla is a well lateralized maxilla so the mid of the nasal system septum should be included medially and laterally the perigo palatine fossa along with the infra temporal fossa now the question do we need to irradiate the lymph nodes electively the answer is elective lymph nodal irradiation is actually not recommended because of the sparse lymph nodal drainage of paranasal sinus when do we irradiate yeah, elective lymph node electively that is when we have a high grade ssu neuroblastoma or a high grade squamous cell carcinoma of the maxilla if there is involvement of nasopharynx or soft palate or skin or the cheek or the maxillary gingiva we should include the elective lymph nodal volumes which means but uh, the t4 onwards if the ethmoid and the maxilla is a t4 maxilla or a t4 ethmoid and involving any of these structures you should give elective lymph nodal rt we should only include level 5 lymph node if there is nasopharynx involvement so we'll get take one example over here and uh, you know this is a 17 year old girl whom i have treated last month and it was a case of an esthetic neuroblastoma cadish c she underwent multiple surgeries with multiple recurrences with cranial nerve palsy right now so for me the patient was already you know some uh, having some blurring of vision in one eye so i had to give uh, since it was cadish c the patient was beyond you know uh, radical treatment for me so what i did was i just included the gtv and gave margins around it and covered and, and and you know spared the optic nerves and the chasm out of it and what i did was we gave i gave 50 gray 20 fractions with strict constraints to the optic nerves and chasm after radiotherapy the patient had an excellent response and as an off level modality i put the patient on carboplatinide and i'm expecting the patient to do do well and for your uh, information the patient has the blurring of vision has also improved by quite a lot so this is a ct4a l0 excuse maxilla. me dr datto uh, yes, i'm sorry to interrupt uh, you short the time by 5 minutes uh, yeah. how long will it take another 2 minutes okay thank you sir okay. so uh, so the patient requested surgery over here and you know the reason i have take, uh, taken this particular uh, uh, slide is because uh, you know here since the, it's a t4 disease and it is involved nearly the skin that is why the the physicians have included the level the lymph nodal elective lymph nodal volumes over here again it's a post ethmoidectomy post nasal exfiltration sphenoidectomy case and this is where you have included the entire post op defect the nasal uh, the, the nasal cavity the ipsilateral maxilla and you have got high up to include the pterygoid plates so if you see you know there will be lots of guidelines prescribing the you know the for, for the the tumor volumes but what important is the oer how do we prescribe the oers and whenever we are doing inverse uh, planning we should always prescribe the oers with priorities and the oers have to be prioritized you know in order from high to low the priorities depend on the proximity of an oer to the ptv you should always prioritize the series oers over parallel ones the parallel oers like parotid may be given higher priority than some you know remote serial oers and say for i'll give an example of this is like like for an oral cavity lesion my priority order would be spinal cord followed by brain stem parotid larynx and cochlea if i am including the skull foramina while for paranasal sinus my visual uh, apparatus comes out first along with the pituitary brain stem parotid and spinal cord at the last at the end you know to make your life very easy you should always go with this particular book i prefer this book you know during my residency my senior residency and even now i do take help of this book i thank my sir on this and with this i would end and open and i'm open to questions thank you so very much thank you so much dr datto uh, since we started 10 minutes late uh, the organizing committee has graciously agreed to give us 5 uh, to 7 minutes to address address some questions and there is still 198 people who are logged in so i'd want to go ahead and ask you a few questions uh, so pita uh, uh, sorry sorry to interrupt so i have answered few questions so uh, there are few another questions uh, i would like to uh, ask dr anupam sorry Sorry, from yeah. I'm taking from you, Pita. Sure, sure. So sure. Uh, the question is, uh, sir, in which case you treat the contralateral neck node in buccal mucosa cases? Onupam, over to you. I would use uh, if there is the 
a midline buccal mucosa lesion for example a midline lip or a floor of mouth that is in the midline in that case i would use uh, you know the contralateral neck but if it is a very very well lateralized i would prefer contralateral neck to be spared one more thing if there is uh, you know if it's say for example is marginally encroaching the midline and you have an extra capsular extension at level 2 i would still irradiate level 2 and level 3 contralateral neck as my elective lymph node volume okay and what is the indication of the port in the patient of pt2 n0 tongue with no hydix features and doi not given i mean you have to mention the doi here you have to yeah, ask the pathologist too Yes, yes, yes. So, so the thing is, if the the depth of invasion is not given, because you remember, if, if previously before this depth of invasion concept came in, uh, you know, in the latest AGCC updates, we were irradiating the T two N zero tongue because at T two N zero the tongues have a higher chance or have a you know more than twenty percent chance of a lymph node involvement. So for the tongue, the early tongue, we have to treat the uh, elective lymph nodes. but if a doi is not given then i believe you know for the benefit of doubt we should irradiate it's a, that gives us even more reason to irradiate the tongue okay so uh, i think it's the last question uh, how do we decide between the sacrificing optic nerve versus pairing if primary is averting ipsilateral optic nerve can induction chemo be tried in case of ethmoid cancer that is question. a that is that is an excellent question now the thing is that what is uh, in an ethmoid uh, ethmoid sinus tumors majority of the tumors you would very very rarely have a squamous cell carcinoma in ethmoid sinus cancer most of the cancers are the essential neuroblastomas in the ethmoid uh, sinus tumors what the problem with this essential neuroblastoma is that the re- the indication of chemotherapy is only in caddish c and that too it is a very off label indication but that is not a new adjuvant rather that is an adjuvant setting or in a palliative setting so i don't know whether a new adjuvant carboplatin etoposide would uh, reduce the tumor volume but if you say that what do i have to you know whether i would sacrifice the optic nerve or whether i have to spare the active uh, optic nerve i need to take two three things into account first of all what is the contralateral vision of the eye number one number two what is the age of the patient number three you know if the disease is you know operable so i would always always counsel the patient to undergo surgery first but if the disease is inoperable there is no point giving a new adjuvant chemotherapy and then we uh, are you know uh, downsizing and then giving irradiating because it could be as good as palliatively treating the patient okay fair enough thank you anupam and uh, i think krita um, uh, you call it a day uh, and uh, lastly i would take uh, the dr shonak has left due to some uh, his personal emergency so whatever you have question it will save in our archive so in the next class if we have time we will discuss it or we can uh, send it uh, i mean you can answer it uh, through your email right and uh, i think uh, dr krita concluding remarks please Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so we come to the end of an excellent discussion. Ita, we cannot hear you. Hello. Hello. I think she is disconnected. Hello. Yeah. Hello. So Ita. I think. Uh, Ah, uh, Peter is disconnected. So I think uh, we'd uh, conclude here. So our next class is on nasopharynx and salivary gland, and uh, we'll start in the same manner of radiology, and uh, followed by two D, and followed by then three D. And uh, so thank you, thank you all the um, uh, faculties, Shushmita ma'am, Alok sir, Anupam, and Dr. Shonokpal. for joining with us uh, to help us to make it successful and obviously our uh, delegates who had joined participants uh, without him it is not possible so thank you stay tuned and we will come back on the next uh, wednesday 7:30 pm sharp thank you and good night everyone thank you good night thank you good night thank you